Uh, thanks very much, and uh, good morning to everyone here and online. Very honored and pleased to be here. Uh, my first Eden workshop and my first time in, in this country and in this city. Um, so very excited to meet you all and um, learn um, a lot about what's, what you've been doing here and uh, what is going on in the world of distance education um, from, from the coming two days. Um, so, as I was introduced, I, um, I work on machine learning, but I've also worked recently in the, let's say, last six, seven years on educational initiatives, and I will talk about those um, in, in this keynote. Um, let me just check what, what the time shows so that I won't spend too much time. Okay. Um, so, so what I'll be talking about is again like revolving about machine learning and AI, but then starting to go towards the implications of them um, in people's lives, um, because what we're doing is really aiming to help um, or offer awareness and understanding of AI to the general public, and more recently also to children of younger age. I was already introduced. Um, so I guess that's that's more more or less what what um, what I wanted to say about that was already said very kindly by Wim in his introduction. So indeed, 1.4 million students on the elements of AI MOOC, which I'll tell a bit more about, and then more um, even more about the Generation AI project, uh, which is a, a large consortium going on now and for the coming few years. So. Okay, let's, let's start. I don't know in Romania if you have these rhymes for like that the kids use to, to choose someone. Like this one in the English language is tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. And then it goes on and then at the end somebody's chosen to be it, whatever you're playing, right? Um, and this one, uh, you might wonder what am I talking about with this uh, nursery rhymes and kids stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this just as a, as a way to introduce very different kinds of lines of work uh, that people do. Um, if you can call being a pirate chief, let's say, or a thief, um, um, a line of work. Um, now, we are all probably in academia, so we're researchers or educators and, um, and people working on these things. So how many of you would know how AI would change the life really of a pirate chief? Or any of the, any of the lines of work that was mentioned in that nursery rhyme? Very few, I'm, I'm quite sure. So we don't probably have pirate chiefs um, in the meeting. Um, and that, that is kind of where I'd where, where my, a lot of my motivation comes from. I have no idea about how AI would work or could help or could harm uh, a person who is com working in a completely different line of work from, from myself. And we'll get, we'll get back to that, why this and how this has shaped the initiatives that I've been involved in. So I'll get back to that. You might still wonder what, what he's talking about, but I, I promise this will become clearer in a bit. So I have two parts in this talk. First part, I'll really talk about what is AI and what are the core concepts. And then the second part, I'll talk really more about how to uh, build um, understanding, build AI literacy, and something we call AI agency or data agency and support the development of that. So let's start with the, with the part, what is AI? according to me. Well, the way I see AI is, um, is a kind of a world into which I can go in and explore and learn about and research it. Um, and of course, there are other worlds like data science, statistics, pedagogy, or you know, even like physics or mathematics. Those for a researcher in those fields of science would be their, their world to explore and learn about. And of course, when we explore a new world, we'd like to draw maps to make sense of where 
we're going and where we are. And in AI, indeed, you could zoom in, yeah, you could find parts of AI that you, have la you can label in different ways. And in the case of AI, machine learning is one such big part of AI. So just like charting the territory, so to speak, I would see AI as a sort of um, an umbrella term and machine learning a part of that, just as, a, as an example. And it's, it, it gets a little bit complicated sometimes because these worlds, these ways of drawing the map, putting things in places, they overlap. And uh, let's say statistics has terms for some things that they call, you know, by statistical terms. And we in AI uh, or computer science would call them by maybe a little, little, little bit different terminology, but they'd be the same thing. So there is overlap. That's what this kind of illustration is kind of supposed to highlight. Um, so that's just the kind of the, I see AI as a field of science. It's something to learn about, it's methods for studying it, and it's the, it's the, it's the things we find there. Um, nothing more than that, in a way, to me. And this is, again, the starting point on which I, I built. Um, you can also use this to distinguish I said machine learning and statistics, or machine learning and AI. So if you want to know the difference between machine learning and AI, if it is written in Python, the programming language, then it is probably machine learning, but PowerPoint, like this presentation here, it's AI. Um, but you know, you might laugh at this, but of course it just means that it's a matter of the, um, how specific I want to be. So in, 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 if indeed machine learning is a part of AI, um, usually when you're talking with a PowerPoint slide set, you want to be kind of very, um, you don't want to be too specific about which aspect of AI we're maybe talking about. I will, of course, talk more specifically, uh, but, but normally you just talk about AI. So it's not, I'm not saying people are kind of uh, fooling you or, or kind of deceiving you when they use PowerPoint. Um, after all, I am using PowerPoint here. Um, okay, but more concretely, uh, that was the kind of the hand-waving thing about how I see AI. The way, actually, now I'll sort of show you um, how I explain what AI is and how it works. Probably many of you already know on the level that I, as I'm going to explain it, so I will not like I will not really be using this to teach you about AI, but I'm maybe giving you an example of how to explain AI to. Um, well, <laughs> I originally wrote here, explain AI to me like I'm five year old, but then I thought, well, actually that's not going to be a good way to explain it to a five year old. It would be a much better way to explain it to a 50 year old. I'm just about 50, so um, so that I, that I know. Um, so, for this one, I would like you to now join me in pretending that we are, for, for, for a little moment, not researchers and not educators. But let's say, just for the sake of sort of this exercise, let's all pretend that we are biologists. Are you with me? Yeah, you're all biologists. Okay. Um, and now what we are doing here is that we are studying lakes. I come from Finland, we have lots of lakes. Um, so here we have data about some lakes and the dots here are that data. Okay, and of course because you are biologists you are very interested in this data. That, that goes without saying. And you want to know of course what this data shows us. I will explain to you. It shows that on the horizontal axis, so from left to right, is the flow rate of the lake, okay? The flow rate tells us how much water flows through that, that lake every day, let's say. How many, let's say, buckets or how many cubic meters of water come in uh, some streams that flow into the lake and then, of course, they would flow out the other end through a, a river, okay? On the right, you have lakes these dots here that have high flow rate, so the water kind of streams rather rapidly. And on the left, you have lakes where the water kind of stays more or less still. All right. And now, of course, you want to know also what is the vertical axis, up, down direction. Well, that is the depth 
of the lake. How deep is the lake? Let's say the average depth. So in the bottom here, the depth is has a low value, so it's a shallow lake. You can, let's say, think maybe this dot is one meter deep only on the average. You can walk through that lake um, um, without getting your hair wet, um, even, even in the summer. In the winter in Finland, you can walk over it without your hair getting wet because it is frozen. Um, at the top here, there are these lakes that are maybe 10 meters deep on the average. Okay, or 15, I don't know. And now the color. The color, as biologists, you are interested in lakes, so you want to know this, about this data. What is the color? Well, the color indicates the, and this is the biological term, eutropification. Eutropification means how much there is something growing in the water, like algae and other things that usually make the water like murky, looking dirty, not so good for the fish, not so good for the people who want to maybe swim there or otherwise. So green is, even the water might start looking a little bit green. Okay, it's not very good condition in terms of the, the uh, ecological status. And the yellow are then in better shape. They're good lakes. The water is clear, Every, everybody likes that. Now, um, I have a question, since I have so many biologists here in the auditorium. Would you think there are these two stars, which are also lakes, one of them is kind of, um, the, both of them are like average depth, right? Because they're like in the vertical direction, like here in the middle. But this one on the left has lower flow rate than an average lake. And the other one has a um, slightly above average flow rate, because it's to the right in the chart. What would you say about the, the eutropification, so the color, if we measure that, um, of, the, of the one on the left? Would you think it is green or yellow? Green? Yellow? Okay. Let's say, let's have raise of hands. How many would say it's green? Quite a few hands. How many would say it's yellow? There's always a few, few, few ones who oppose. And then um, on the right, uh, the one on the right, how many would vote, raise of hands again, green? Okay, a couple. And how many would say yellow? Quite a few. Now, would anyone volunteer to explain your reasoning why would you, why did you come to your expert conclusion uh, about the color? Anyone? Thank you very much. Expert biologist here says that the flow rate uh, indicates that, uh, or the data indicate that a lower flow rate uh, tends to mean uh, murkier water. So green uh, color, uh, eutropification, and uh, higher flow rate, the opposite. Did anyone have other arguments supporting their decision, or everybody more or less agree with that? Nothing to add? No, at this point we don't have more data, so that's all, all you have. Anyone want to add anything? It's, it's, it's about probability, so you couldn't maybe say for sure, but you're giving uh, your best probability estimate. Mm -hmm. All right, so we could use AI now here. I, have, um, I can push this button here. This is an AI tool. I can push this button, and then the AI will tell us its prediction. Okay, shall I try that? Sure. Everybody wants to know, so let's click here. Ah, AI was very efficient, and AI inferred now that the, the, this one would be green and this one would be yellow. So, kind of in agreement to with uh, the consensus in the auditorium, as far as I could, I could count. And AI also drew that these kind of lines here, so from this star to that uh, dot, and that star for, to that dot. And this is an explanation of how the AI algorithm worked. It simply chose the nearest 
point the so-called nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor in this data. And make make no mistake, it's not the nearest lake in like geographical sense. It's not that it looked at the map where these lakes are. It's not the nearest lake in that sense. It is the most similar lake in terms of the flow rate and the depth. Okay, just to be clear. Um, and by that, it arrived at the same conclusion again as the consensus in the auditorium, which is kind of remarkable. And that I, I kind of want to underline here. Every time I explain to anyone how AI works, um, I would want to underline the point that, for instance, in a case like that, AI methods would give us the same prediction or similar prediction a lot of the time as us as humans, as you as expert biologists, as you were pretending to be, perhaps. Um, but it works on an entirely different level. It didn't use the information or the semantics of flow rate. You know, we can all think and say, well, the flow rate sounds actually like it might be a causal mechanism because the, the water flows and whatever algae are growing there, they'll just flow to the downstream river and then the water will be replenished with fresh water coming in, right? It makes sense. We, we have that kind of common sense understanding of things or even our expert knowledge about biology we might have. And we think on those terms and we can use that to come to these kind of um, estimates of, of, of the status of the, of the lake's eutrophification in this case or any other case where we're using AI. And AI, of course, in this case at least, it used only these numbers, only the little numbers that it has. Um, here, the few numbers and the simple numbers in terms of their distances on the chart. And, and still it comes to the same um, conclusion or prediction. Um, and indeed, that method is called the nearest neighbor. Classifier this is a well-established method from the 1950s. It's not, it's not a recent uh, innovation in that sense. Uh, it's probably the simplest possible method, which is why I love it so much. Um, and it's actually hard to beat, which is why I hate it so much. Because, <laughs> because I, uh, my day job is to develop new machine learning methods, and it has happened many, many times that we have tried our like very clever idea and it has been worse in performance compared to the nearest neighbor method. And that, that is really annoying sometimes. Um, but then again, this method can get very slow if you have, let's say, hundreds of millions of data points um, collected about something. And then you'd have to go through that data to find the nearest neighbor every time you're trying to make a prediction with the method. Um, so it becomes very slow and actually that's one of the lines of research that I do in my, like that part of my work where I just study machine learning methods. And that's, that's interesting in its own right. Okay, so let's go, like that was the part how I explain to people how AI works and uh, how machine learning works. Well, why do I do that? Why do I find it interesting to tell them on that level, that kind of technical level, in a, in a way, the level of the algorithm underlying these methods, why do I do that? Well, the purpose is that now having done this exercise, having thought about how it actually works, how it compares to human reasoning, um, and realizing that it's very different from human reasoning, um, People, I can give people a list like that and I can ask, start asking them, do you think AI is able to do this or that? Let's say I can ask people, do you think it is able to process massive amounts of data? Yes, it is able to do that. So that's a check. Is it able to recognize patterns? Yes, it was able to recognize the pattern that in that previous uh, example, on the left there were more green dots and on the right there were more yellow dots. That's a pattern and it is easily able to capture that. Is it able to find a needle in the haystack? So let's say a lake that is very similar to the one that we're interested in among hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of points. Yes, no problem, it will find it. Uh, well, the next one, is it able to predict human behaviors? Well, that's a kind of a 
debatable question, what I do mean by that. But if you think of a case where we'd apply the same method, the nearest neighbor method, on a, an online store, let's say Amazon, or even like uh, you know, YouTube or Netflix, where it recommends us content, is it able to predict what kind of products we'd be able to buy? Well, yes. That's how they. That's how, how like the platform companies make money because they are able to predict what we'd be interested in buying, what type of ads to serve us. So I would have to say yes, it is able to predict human behaviors, even though it doesn't understand anything about the human condition, about why humans behave the way they do or we do. Um, is it able to think outside the box or see patterns not present in the data? No. How could it? I mean, if the pattern is not there in the data, then the nearest neighbor method will not start thinking, well, you know, uh, COVID was a good humbling experience to many machine learning researchers when we thought that we can predict things, right? We can predict people's behavior. But suddenly, sometimes overnight, a rule was imposed that you cannot, let's say, travel to another country. And of course, that changes people's behaviors dramatically, but it's not there yet in the data. So it's really hard to predict how people behave without somehow like, or, or with these techniques. And of course, as humans, we're able to tell, well, okay, now probably not a good time to start um, a, a campaign uh, for a hotel because people will not be able to travel there. But for the machine learning algorithm, that was, that was a, you know, it took a while before they start picking up patterns in the data after the, the, these dramatic changes. Reasoning and planning, well again, I would have to explain and define carefully what I mean by them, but I would argue that no, they can't reason. They can't reason in the sense that they would reason, for instance, that the flow rate has something to do with the quality of the water. They'll just see the data and predict and not reason and plan. Um, in that sense. Of course, there are ways to define, let's say, planning in ways that would change that answer. So, for instance, your navigation app, Google, app, Google Maps, or whatever you use to find the fastest way to drive from A to B, that's a planning algorithm. So, of course, in the sense they also are able to do some of that. But common sense, definitely, I would say common sense reasoning, again, um, is is a really challenging thing for AI. And again, my point of do, going through that list now is not to have you memorize that list. You don't have to memorize that list because we went through how the algorithm works and you can always sort of figure out answers to these kind of questions um, by going back to that algorithm, that principle. It works based on the data. And that's, uh, that's why I want to teach usually AI on, on a little bit more uh, technical level understanding the mechanisms, the, 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 the techniques, why, how AI algorithms work, because then people can figure out these things on their own. If I, would ha only, if I wouldn't explain to people how it works, I would just show lists like that. I would have to show an extremely long list, and still it would not be helpful when they have an, a question about can it do this or that, which is not on the list. But with the more like technical knowledge, they can, they can sort of generalize and, and explain themselves. Um, or figure out themselves whether it's a check mark or a, um, or a no. Okay, and where do we do that? Now I come to the elements of AI. That's an example exactly doing that, going through, let's say, the, the nearest neighbor method and many other methods on that level. Uh, with no formulas, no mathematics. Well, there's a little mathematics there, but you know, the nearest neighbor method, for instance, is explained um, the way I explained it just now. Um, and also, like, how do we define AI? Again, that question about, you know, machine learning, AI, how do they relate to each other? And we started in 2018 um, by, cons by doing the, the, creating the course. We did it with the University of Helsinki and, a, um, and an ed tech company called MinnaLearn. Uh, um, it's completely free online. If you go to elementsofai.com, uh, you can browse the content. You don't even have to sign up to browse the content. It exists in something like 25 different languages, including Romanian. So we first did it in English and Finnish, then Swedish, Estonian, and German were the first international partners. 
we found partners in those countries and they wanted to support with the translations and setting up the local, um, let's say the initiatives, Norway, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, uh, um, French, Belgium, Malta, so on and so forth, so forth, Romania, all official EU languages, um, except Hungarian, uh, in 2020. And then we had a pilot, which is still running in Kenya. And then 2024, we're gonna have one more language version, but what I can't tell you yet what, what that is, but we're very, very excited to support uh, that country, which is facing very difficult times at the time being. Um, we have 1.4 million, this is from yesterday, uh, what that number, how many sign up, signed up users. In Romania, it's uh, almost 8,000 users by now. Um, so very, very happy about that. Hopefully we'll get maybe a few more um, in, the, in the coming weeks as well. And, and altogether, we have almost 170 countries uh, from which people have uh, signed up on the course. Most of them on the English version, uh, but uh, of course also uh, lots in, uh, let's say, Spanish version is very, very popular because there's so many Spanish-speaking people. And it's kind of a, it's pretty uniform or a balanced gender distribution, which we're very proud of because it is not always the case with computer science education. Uh, in the Nordic countries, for instance, uh, it's more than 50% female users. And we've also got like a fair share of people who are not no longer students, let's say typical students. So like, you know, you'd have people over the 45 year uh, mark. Uh, so most, most of them would be in the working life. So they're doing lifelong learning and, um, and that's very good. Um, somebody mentioned that you had um, a student or like two students, a, a father and a son. Um, we've also had a similar thing I heard about a, a, a lady who wanted to learn about AI, but they thought, well, it's harder to do it alone, so they invited their own mother and their own daughter. So it was three generations who were studying as a group um, and learning about AI on, on the Elements of AI course, and they gave very good feedback about that experience. So there's three generations. And it's uh, recently updated, or well, last year updated on uh, large language models because they are such a big thing. Okay, so that's, um, that, uh, that is the elements of AI. Now, if we go to the younger generations, um, I showed you how, to, how I explain AI to a 50-year-old. Um, that's you know, how the elements of AI basically works. Now, we've also tried to do it and approach the topic to teach it to school children, let's say to 13-year-old kids, which is um, probably what those uh, kids are here. <laughs> Um, and we're using, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Teachable Machine. So Google has released earlier, like I think uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, something called the Teachable Machine. Um, so we have our own Teachable Machine and you can download it at that um, URL. And it is um, safer and more privacy preserving and privacy protecting because it doesn't send any data, any of the pictures that the kids will take to Google servers. It doesn't send the data anywhere. It just it does it in the browser. So we found that is a very good um, uh, feature in the system. And it's also got like more bells and whistles and functionalities. Um, so we're doing that. Um, and the purpose of that, let's say this generation AI, so generation AI, again, the project, uh, teachable machine, here's some research papers on that, is to tell the kids about the concepts of training, uh, or like let's say data, and then training algorithms, a classifier, and that's what the kids are doing here, they're training a classifier. And, and then what they learn about is really how, uh, so I think somebody mentioned trial and error, uh, <laughs> it was related to humans, but, but here trial and error is the, tr is the method of trying different settings in the, in the algorithm, uh, so that's how the algorithm kind of learns uh, from examples by trial and error that computers can do that too. The kids will be understanding that. And then there is something called bias in the data in the sense that the data might not be completely representative. And, and these are the kind of conceptual um, things we're trying to convey to the children and so that they'd be able to understand the, 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 uh, the properties, how these systems impact 
our lives. And, and it's been really encouraging to see that this, um, at least that age group, has no trouble sort of coming with the, up with the links from data and the training uh, to, the, to the, you know, the biases that these algorithms have. Um, and that's, that's sort of really, um, that's been really encouraging how, to, how, how, how well they, um, we've sort of picked up these notions. One of the underlying things there, I'd like to point out, like a th more theoretical point, is uh, computational thinking 2.0, which is a kind of a, a term coined by uh, some of the people in, in the project. Um, um, you might be familiar probably with the computational thinking 1.0, so computational thinking as you normally call it, uh, where these systems uh, that you discuss and try and explain are rule driven, this procedural thinking that you know algorithm is a sequence of steps, very explicit steps that you follow one by one, deterministically every time the same way. You know, that's how the kids are taught and they will learn how programs are built, how computer computers are programmed um, but with uh, sort of they can be contrasted in, um, by different um, let's say different mechanisms different ideas when we're talking about data driven systems like AI and machine learning systems where um, you where you don't design the algorithm and the rules by hand you basically filter and clean data and then you just feed it into the machine and then you train the models and you evaluate the models and they might work you know, up to certain percentage, certain accuracy, but you can't prove, let's say, that they do uh, a certain calculation correctly, which you could do like in the traditional programming um, notions. So this, is, this has been very helpful in us identifying what are the concepts that we need to teach to the kids and then we kind of try and evaluate whether they've captured those concepts just as a kind of a theoretical background to the work. All right, I'll, um, I'll just summarize the, the first part um, by saying that everybody can understand these things, be them 13-year-old or 50-year-old. And they can even understand them if they don't have any technological or technical training or maths skills or, or anything like that. So that's, that is definitely uh, proven by the success of these initiatives, uh, by the elements of AI, by the Generation AI project. Um, and the Generation AI project, I wanted to highlight that these like thinking tools, like the ones that are referred to in the computational thinking 2.0 framework and others, um, are, are the ones that we at least find very useful in building up those tools, the activities, the, the school interventions, um, and that's, um, that's how we go. And the project does exactly that, so we kind of, do research, we develop teaching methods and materials, and they kind of inform back towards our research, of course, when we evaluate them and learn more. Um, okay, now I, that was part one, and now comes part, not part two yet, part one prime. So I've had to include this part because of what happened um, a couple years ago, this great earthquake of California, as I'd like to say. Um, so OpenAI releasing ChatGPT, which sent these like seismic waves, figuratively speaking, around the world in split seconds. Um, so everybody knows ChatGPT, uh, even if they hadn't, had never thought about AI really, uh, now everybody sort of at least has that interface, that contact with these AI tools and technologies in their lives. Um, and it's also something that is very, very prominent in machine learning uh, conferences where I, where I go. So at least half of the workshops, let's say, in big conferences are somehow related to that. It's kind of crazy. Um, I will not, perhaps you know already well enough how these systems work. I would usually, again, explain them by having by them, the systems being trained on massive amounts of training data of text using a statistical machine learning algorithm. It's not the nearest neighbor method, but you know it has certain, it, it has the same limitations as a, as, a, as, a, as the nearest neighbor method. So that at that point, understanding that nearest neighbor method at least helps you understand what does it mean 
what, what does it mean when I say statistical machine learning algorithm? And then at, at, the, at the outcome of that learning is not coloring of dots or predictions of individual things, but it's a trained model that says um, after a certain sequence of words, which we call the prompt, as you know, uh, it predicts what might be the next word or token. It could be like another symbol, not a word. And in this case, you know, for instance, it would predict that the word that and the word thus are quite probable continuations, but the word the is, is very unlikely continuation of that. You know, that's, and that's the idea. And that's what the system tries to do, predict what is the next word given, given the prompt uh, based on this training data. Um, Again, uh, no, let's, let's not go deeper into that. Again, I'm just usually trying to explain those things so that people could understand what these language models can do and what they can't do. For, that, for them to be able to answer these questions rather than me having them memorize these things. So again, they can do language checking because they are language models. They figure out patterns in language, which words you know, basically fit together, which don't. Um, they can do translations. Um, uh, they can help you with brainstorming, coming up with crazy ideas, um, because there's no wrong answers in brainstorming. It's just about creativity. Um, it's basically, they're able to write messages, let's say, send meeting invitations and process replies to them, uh, but they can't do fact checking. There's no database from which they would check any facts and figures. They're just predicting what would be a likely answer to a question um, that, they're, they're, that they're asked. And again, reasoning or the use of logic, they usually fail on that level because they're predicting words occurring together, not, um, let's say, reasoning or logical rules. And you shouldn't use them for decision making in, in, in some sense. I should define, of course, more precisely what I mean by that, but again, on this level, um, people can figure out this on their own. All right, so that was the generative AI part, uh, which I just add there as one part, uh, part uh, one prime. But now um, to the second part um, on agency. What do I mean by agency? There's, there's a nice paper on, on that if you write, like to read more, but I'll, I'll explain very briefly. Uh, when I say, what, what I mean when I say that access is not is kind of less than literacy, which is less than agency. So always the next part requires a bit more effort to achieve. So access first um, would be something uh, like the One Laptop Per Child initiative from the 2005, just providing access to laptops, affordable devices to children um, and families, and thinking that it, sol it solves something on its own has been found to be quite naive. You know, just having the laptop but no, nothing to do with it is not really going to help. Well, AI literacy was the next big thing. Uh, for instance, in research, there's a search in research, um, research literature mentioning AI literacy. Um, basic understanding, resources, tools and technologies, hands-on activities, and understanding how to use them. But with this, you're going to be able to gain um, skills and be a good user, a good customer, so to speak. But you're not necessarily critically evaluating any of those things. So I would actually sort of emphasize the critical part um, of AI literacy. And there's a nice um, essay by uh, Mahabali on, on that, which I recommend. Um, and then we go to the agency. This is kind of the, the sort of Coming, coming to the sort of conclusion of, of, of this, uh, what I mean by AI or data agency is really um, what has been the, the goal of the elements of AI from the beginning. is not to tell people that AI is bad or not to tell them that it's good. I'm not going to tell them like how they should react. It's not my job to tell people what value, how it com is compatible with their values or not but I'd like to push them from the passive mindset to the active mindset, so kind of to this direction. And even better, actually, I would like them to have these nuanced notions that, okay, this idea, this application of AI I don't like, and this application of AI I do like. 
it's, I think it's not like a very sort of um, nuanced idea if you just say that every AI application is a good thing and we should promote it, or to say the other way around. But I think depending on the application, I think people should have like maybe negative or positive attitude. And I'm completely fine if people react negatively as, they, as long as they're reacting and as long, long as they're active in the sense that like this F the algorithm riots that followed in the UK when the A-levels were, the, the, the students couldn't take the A-levels because of COVID and so the results were kind of predicted by machine learning algorithms and they were not completely unbiased, of course, and people were very active, even though they were feeling negatively about that. And I'm very happy that they do that, because then they will take part in the public discussion and we'll steer together where we're going. Um, and in the Generation AI project, on the other hand, we do that by this so-called social media machine. Um, and I'm just checking, how, do I still have a few minutes? Okay. Plenty of time. Okay, good. Um, so I um, just don't want to overstay my welcome. Um, so in the Generation AI project, as I said, we have something called the social media machine. Again, digital machine was the one before, and now this is the social media machine. And we felt that it's important to address this particular application of AI, namely social media, because the children from very early on, they will be exposed to it, and they, it will sort of very deeply uh, impact their lives, the, the, the mindsets that they, that they grow with and the kind of world view that they build because they will maybe get even news from social media and nowhere else, uh, which is scary actually. Um, so this is how the social media machine works. There's a paper that's come out and there's more papers coming on the way. It's basically like Instagram. So if you've used Instagram, you'll recognize it's, a, it's an image feed that you can scroll and then you can react to those images by you know, emoji or um, you know, commenting or sharing that content. And so the kids will do that in the classroom together and then they'll be able to react to each other's sharings. And, um, and once you've done a little bit of that browsing on the app, they will be shown a, a sort of a data view showing data that collected of them, the, you know, sort of kind of um, um, outlining the profile that has been built based on their engagement, which content they liked or shared, and then uh, it'll explain what content will be recommended to them as they can continue using them. So for instance, here it shows that this image, the user has 10 out of 10, so maximum engagement. So the user has engaged with this image um, to the maximum by viewing it, um, looking at it for 9.8 seconds. I mean, it's, it's you, you don't necessarily realize, but when you're, you're, when you're scrolling a feed like that on YouTube or Instagram, TikTok, the amount of time that you spend looking at the picture is recorded. You don't have to like it. You don't have to start the video, even the pausing uh, so that the, the content is there on your screen is recorded as, uh, as a measure of engagement, as a measure of your interest in that content, which is kind of surprising, right? You, you'd think that, well, I didn't even look at the, I didn't even kind of click open that content, but if it's on the screen in the preview of the video or the picture, it will be recorded like it is here. And then they shared it with and they commented and they followed and they reacted. So that's the maximum engagement with that content. And then after each user, each student in the classroom has done that, uh, they can, we, can, we can display them this kind of um, uh, social network. How the different users form clusters where each cluster has like similar interests. Here there's a cluster on sports here there's a cluster on vehicles, so probably like cars, motorbikes. Uh, here there's a cluster on food enthusiasts and, and nature and animals. Um, and you can see that you can easily identify the groups from their browsing data, 
from their behavioral data on the app. And it's funny, I was there in the classroom when they were doing one of these interventions, and then the kids were like, ah, yes, we know exactly. So there's the group of those like gamers who were interested in, you know, Playstations and um, Overwatch and whatever. And then, you know, we know these like sports uh, team, they are in the same team, so they would form a group. So it's usually reflecting the actual groups uh, that are also known to the students already beforehand in the group. Um, so it can kind of get into get into that, you know, tap into the social um, dynamics of the class very easily, just browsing the pictures. Um, and the, co the, the concepts that we do try and teach them by that tool, this is another screenshot how it works, um, are again the same ones. So there's the, tra the, the data that we collect, there's the training mechanism for building the machine learning model that recommends new content. Um, there's something called a profile, which is the kind of um, uh, summary of our interests. Um, there's a filter that filters new content that is demonstrated by this view, where this is kind of a sort of a heat map. That's the latest feature we developed, where you show all the content and say, for this user, you'll see content from this part of, the, of all the content, and then from that part. And you can show that different users have very different um, um, recommendations. So some users will be recommended content from here or here, but not there and there. And that leads to polarization. So we get in different bubbles uh, very easily when we use that. And that is very easy to demonstrate on this very um, screen and this view. And then you can sort of continue the discussion on, uh, on, on topics like misinformation being spread, uh, which is a part of um, like the socio-technical uh, dynamics. So we start with the technical content, like what is the data, what is this profile exactly, how does it help you filter things and recommend things, and then we can build understanding of the societal dynamics uh, that that um, arise from the use of those tools and, the, uh, and, and from our human societal psychological um, behaviors. So it's it's kind of fun to see how well 13-year-olds will understand that. At the end of the session, the best bit is that we ask them to write letters to decision makers, right? So the kids will have a homework assignment, write a letter from children's point of view, how do you perceive social media? Uh, what do you like about it, what you don't like about it? Um, and what should we do about that? and they address that to the decision makers. And we've agreed that we, we collect those letters, we create summaries of them, and we'll actually take them to the decision makers. And I can say that I've heard somebody, or I've um, seen some of those letters, and the letters that I've seen are really encouraging in the sense that if, if adults, if politicians, if people making decisions about the regulation of social media, and AI in general, would have the same level of nuance and same level of, of let's say, um, rational arguments about, about these things, we'd be in a much better place than we are currently. Like, if you, if you hear what politicians say about these platforms, like, okay, ban this or that, that is the sort of the level at which people understand, oh, it's a bad thing, let's ban it. Or it's a good thing, let's not regulate it at all. It's like really, very blunt tools that are being discussed. And the kids are able to understand them in a much more nuanced and a balanced manner. Okay, there are good things, there are bad things. We could get rid of the bad things and get to the good things. Um, so this is really encouraging, uh, the way the kids have learned. Um, I put some findings from a study where we've actually studied what kids learn. Um, I'm saying this is just preview. This is not published results yet. I, I just realized this is going to be on YouTube, so I'm not sure how helpful it is for me to say don't share this. <laughs> but, but anyways, um, this it's fine. I'm sure um, I will not tell you from which papers, and so it's all anonymous and all that. But uh, anyway, so these are the preliminary results of studying the social media machine. Um, we've had total over 200 children take part in these studies in over 10 schools. Um, and then we asked them questions like pre and post, how 
know how, uh, how much they think they know um, uh, on recommendation system, how recommendation systems work. Uh, and it, we can see that they, well, they would at least report understanding them better um, after the experiment, after being sort of going through these classroom sessions. And they know and understand how social media collects information about them and all that, There's like dozens of questions like that. And this I found also interesting. Um, it asks, um, how do the activities of other users influence what kinds of content does Instagram recommend to, well, Jarmo, this particular, particular user, in, a, in an example case. And then more than 50% couldn't answer that at all. How other users' behavior affect the, feed, the, the content that, let's say, I'm getting on the social media platform. Um, before the test, but only 35% uh, were unable to answer that question. And the answers are kind of very balanced and comprehensive after the session. So that's a, that's a good indication that they'd actually be able to also not only say that they understand, but actually convincingly um, answer a question about how they work. So that's a very positive learning outcome um, as far as I can see. So just summarizing again, um, access is not enough, even literacy, so being able to use those systems, understand them, is not enough unless you're able to be critical and you're able to have a voice in the conversation. And that's what we're really trying to do, even with the kids. Give them a voice in the conversation. Maintain and retain their agency in, in AI and technology. Um, and the argument that I usually present is that these ethical and regulatory decisions are political questions. There's really no way I could, as a computer scientist, solve them for everybody else's behalf. So we need to have other people, not educators or researchers, making all those decisions on other people's behalf, but we should have other people making their own mind about them. And of course, if they make their own mind, it's better that they're informed. They're making an informed decision rather than something driven by, let's say, the public message um, in the headlines or some other uh, thing trying to feed them, like uh, their, their own notions and own agenda. Um, so we need people to be informed and we need to active, make them active, activate people. And that, there I come to the pirate chief again. I don't know what the pirate chief should, should they like AI or not. It is up to them to decide. I can only offer them the knowledge and the encouragement to form an informed opinion. And then we'll have a really fulfilling discussion all together based on facts and based on real science and understanding, and I think we'll be in a better place after that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Timo, for this inspiring uh, talk. Uh, and it's a good introduction to the rest of the workshop, I think. Uh, and I, I learned a lot. Uh, and I also have a couple of questions. Uh, but uh, I first would like to give the floor to the audience here in the room. Uh, if they have questions, anyone? Uh, yes, please, Denise. Uh, I think I have to run with the microphone. So. Uh, <laughs> I think you need to first no, put, it? push there. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring. And um, first of all, a very simple question. Very impressive number of MOOCs. There are lots of MOOCs with impressive numbers. How many completed? And um, did you have any form of assessment? Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, how many completed the elements of AI is around 13%, uh, 
of whoever, like of yes, the number started. of signups, yeah. um, which we find encouraging because, of course, the idea is not that everybody needs, the, let's say, the credits. Mm. Uh, if somebody needs a piece of information, and once they've gotten that information, I'm completely fine them carrying on with their lives. Um, the uh, question about assessment, uh, there are um, exercises in the course itself as people go. Some of them are automatically graded and some of them are peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and based on those exercises, we, um, if you complete them with enough correctness mm -hmm. and to like enough of them in numbers, uh, then you get uh, completed. So there's no like exam at the end. Some universities who grant credits for it, they have separate exams okay. um, to, let's say, make sure that, let's say, you know, the right person answered the question and not, not the, somebody else. Can I ask you another question on the second part? Yeah. This was very exciting. This is about understanding recommender mm. engines. So, and these are 13 year olds who are curious, active, probably doing a bit of programming on the side, maybe some of them. So was there a socio-emotive response once they understood what this was about? So like a shock, like, oh. my goodness, look what yeah. this is doing. Yes. Did you see that? Yes, yes. So first of all, I, I think most of them ha had not done any programming before. Oh, okay. I mean, there were just like normal school classes, not like volunteers or early adopters. Um, uh, but they were really, I think they were so captivated with the, with the familiarity because they'd had, most of them had seen Instagram or similar tools before. So they were all like from the get go, they were like, oh yes, this content. And then every time the teacher would pause their browsing just to, you know, have this like conversations and all that, they were like, oh no, why did you stop it? We, you know, we need to continue. So it, I've never like seen a classroom as excited and engaged with the topic as, as that. Um, and in the letters, they indeed, they would say that, the, for, for instance, this fact that the system records how long, how many seconds, like 10.8 seconds, I was looking at that picture. And they were like shocked. Oh, does it actually follow me that accurately? And then the other thing that they were like, a little bit uh, not at ease with was the fact how well the system would capture their interests, even without them thinking that they're actually volunteering mm. to give any information about them. So that was a, certainly a reaction that we got in many of the letters that they feel that it's, it's intrusion. Because I'm just looking at, you know, cats and dogs mm. and not like filing a report about who I am. And then the system suddenly sees through that. And that is definitely, I think it's a healthy reaction that yeah. many of us probably will have when we, when we realize that. So I, this is the last question. This is so exciting. <laughs> Did, because you've got a sandbox there for hmm. them to play with. Did any of them try and produce some fake news? For example, I want to convince my peers to do something they don't really want to do. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Actually, that is something that we've been thinking about. Coming up, like gamifying. We're, I don't remember seeing, I was only in the one classroom, but I don't remember them actually seeing that. But having discussed with the people who run like those 12 schools and 200 kids experiments, um, we have been thinking about that. I don't know if the idea came from the students themselves or from the, from the people, people running it and in the project, uh, but we've been thinking how to come up with this exactly that kind of game. How to um, present yourself different from how you are or, or otherwise um, sort of kind of play the game and, and take control. And I think that is something that very much fits with the agency yeah, idea. Yeah, you see, uh, if I could have that, I'd try and convince my vice chancellor to give me some more money towards <laughs> student success based on all the data that I've collected. Thank you, I'd better stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for the questions. Thank you, Denise. Uh, yeah, uh, Diana? Uh, before asking my question, I need to say the questions which are online. 
<laughs> so you have quite a lot of uh, congratulations and quite a lot of people asking how they can do the Elements AI course and how they can access the tools which you've been presenting. So if you want to uh, re-say again that yes. uh, about the tools and elements of AI, please. Oh, thanks very much. That is very encouraging. Uh, thanks for all um, for for the kind words and interest. Uh, elements of AI. Well, probably easiest to just like to use a search engine and punch in elements of AI. You'll probably get five to six sponsored advertisements from competing course providers, so don't fall for those, but scroll to the first actual hit and you'll get it. Uh, or you can go direct to elementsofai.com and choose your language, uh, so it's easy, easy to find. Um, and the, um, about the Generation AI project, uh, that is actually a little bit more difficult. I did have a link on the slides at some point. Um, the, the problem is that Generation AI is not exactly the most original name for a project. Um, so there's probably 10 or 15 projects by the very same name. Um, but I give you a clue. It's letters S-T-N. S-T-N. So if you type in, in the search box, Generation AI and then S-T-N, uh, that is the funding agency, um, then you'll actually get to the right project, more likely than not. And, and then we have all the materials there. With the, um, I have to say and warn that for the, um, uh, for the teachable machine, on one hand, we have very good materials for like classrooms and for independent users, and it's, it's very well supported with document documentation. But with the social media machine, we haven't come up with comprehensive documentation yet. So you're going to have to be a little bit like adventurous and just like go and try it. You can't break it, and you can't, it's, it's pr private. Uh, in every case, so you can't, you know, do something foolish <laughs> so that anyone else could see. So you can go and try, um, uh, but uh, the documentation is not very, you know, complete yet. But we're working on that very actively. Okay, and the other, uh, we have some several questions. So I'll try to be succinct and just pick those which are more interesting. One, Ivan Afurak is saying, how it will be solved the color problem in the example if there were two neighbors of different colors at the same t distance? Mm -hmm. Will the color be in between, mm -hmm. or the next closest neighbor will be taken into account? And she mentions, I'm over 50. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, great question. Um, and that uh, is actually, um, well, it's, it is a very good question, and there are many options of doing that. And, and so there are many variants of the algorithm. So she was already coming up with <laughs> the person who asked this question was already doing kind of machine learning research. So welcome to the club. Um, um, and these, all these like different alternatives exist. Um, and, and many times um, you would just automatically pick, let's say, 50 nearest neighbors. Well, in the case, we only had 20 dots. So maybe you take like three nearest neighbors uh, to begin with. And that will also help you gain uh, like uncertainty uh, estimate. So if among the, let's say, 10 nearest neighbors, there's five of one color and five of the other color, then you will probably report that now our prediction is very much 50-50. So, so exactly, you can sort of get to the probabilities also that way. But that's, I, we, we could continue, <laughs> but <laughs> that's know, really and, interesting. And now I have a question. This is coming from me. Mm -hmm. As, uh, because I know that you also teach about artificial intelligence and especially machine learning and data, but not only that. How you envision, for example, the action of universities, more or less, or even schools, that they need to take into education, uh, I mean, either create curricula or have it a compulsory course about AI or AI literacy, or how do you see that to really encompass, also prepare us the future generation, mm. because you said it's a generation AI, in fact. So how you how yeah. we can do that? Yeah, it's it's true, and indeed the fact that we're doing education for the generation AI, of course, it's going to be very long path to having the all the society educated if we only work in schools, because. I mean, we're unfortunately, it's too bad, but we can't go back to school. We should, but we can't. So we can't just wait for the new generation to take over the society. So we should offer lifelong learning opportunities. Um, of course, in universities, I'm not going to say anything very original when I say that all universities should offer AI training to everyone in 
taking any degree, not only technical degrees, but also like law, medicine, architecture, anything. And so they should have been, they should have availability to some AI, uh, re, um, AI, AI studies. And that needs to be separated into technical knowledge because I give courses where you need to be able to program and do some mathematics, uh, but that is not suitable for uh, every student at the university. Um, so the other faculties should sort of also do their job and come up with some AI education. Um, of course, the elements of AI, it is already university level education, and that is actually incorporated in many universities um, degree structures so that you can take it and then that's kind of covering at least some of that. Uh, but then we should also open, of course, open to uh, everyone. Not, you know, not university is not everything. So you know, there's lots of people who don't go to university, and so we should do open education. But again, you know, you and I both have worked on MOOCs for a long time. So I, again, you, you're among the front runners already 25 years, and I think every university should follow your example and, and our example in, in offering this open education. And I think that's that's the only way. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking around. Oh yeah, I see another question there. Um, congrats for your presentation, very interesting. Um, I would like to tell you that um, because um, since uh, 10 years ago, uh, I started to integrate MOOCs in my courses, the same uh, Diana. Uh, First of all, uh, we learn uh, students to continuously learn and uh, we put them to discover MOOCs and to assess them, to evaluate and so on. And I uh, want to tell you that a number of um, Romanian students are of course mine because uh, all the time when I present uh, platforms and MOOCs, they uh, choose uh, your uh, MOOC. Uh, and it's great, of course. And we can learn about uh, uh, artificial intelligence from such a valuable MOOC. And uh, speaking about the second part of uh, your presentation, uh, that tool uh, in which uh, pupils can learn about recommendation and so on. Um, I have an idea, maybe a suggestion. Uh, what uh, and in what uh, sense uh, their parents, their teachers would um, change uh, their way in uh, which uh, they uh, monitor and guide uh, their pupils and children if they understand all these algorithms. If uh, you put them to try, you can uh, have uh, their feedback. Maybe uh, some changes uh, will come. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much. I mean, that, that, that is such a brilliant idea. Like, of course, like, of course we should have the parents, the guardians of um, underage children, and, and also teachers, whoever advised them, also go through the same exercise. Because then, um, a lot of the time, there is the impression that the kids know these tools, uh, so that the parents think that, oh, I can't meddle with that. I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll step back. But that's not the right reaction. Of course, the parents should show interest and they should try and understand what their kids are doing there in the online world. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's, um, that's a great, that's, that's a really good idea. We should do this like uh, family workshops uh, where it's the family together. I mean, that, that's even nicer. Again, we can have multiple generations learning together and that's always very, very nice. Yes, we'll, we'll do that. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question and the answer. Uh, are there more questions in the room? Yes. Sir? I think I will have to keep my questions for the coffee break. Hello, uh, <laughs> my, name is, uh, my name is Ruslan Romano. I'm from the Open University in the UK, like Denise, and I have a question which is uh, uh, sort of humorous maybe, but you said you were going to develop uh, or to impart some AI knowledge to the pirate chief who probably isn't uh, a very ethical person. Yeah. So is there any ethical decision making when you impart this knowledge to the pirate chief? And uh, going forward, should future AI models embed this sort of ethical decision making at all? Yeah, um, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky question, I think. Um, 
Uh, well, first, I'll, I'll, it, it's an interesting topic that this, like, ethics is so prominent in our discussions now, and I think it's a good thing. I can tell that it hasn't always been that case. I'm, I'm sure many of you kind of also have the same experience. I bumped into my own master's thesis a while ago, and you can imagine it was a long while ago when I wrote that previous millennium. Oh, wait, it was just, okay, 2001, so... Anyways, and I was looking at my master's thesis, just out of curiosity, I was browsing it, and then I bumped into, in the beginning, this statement that, okay, this application of machine learning, which I was working on, um, has some ethical considerations, because it can help, it can sort of lead to violations of our privacy. Um, and then I wrote this curious sentence, it appears that we engineers are not expected to be bothered and slowed down by these kind of questions. So we'll turn attention to the technical questions. I completely like sidestep and I said, I'm not expected to think about that. And it's really curious that I kind of explicitly stated that. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't bring myself to make a, such a statement now. It's completely changed, which is great again. Um, okay, now to the concrete question about the power chief. I think it is not very sustainable um, to try and um, uh, guard knowledge. I think uh, what we're going to have to do is be open with knowledge, uh, but then have regulations and also like support policies that pe help people behave ethically, even with the power that the technological, the no no technological knowledge gives them. Um, I mean, that's like, this is actually a question that is being debated whether AI knowledge should be um, uh, closed in a similar manner as nuclear technology is. So people try and keep some sort of um, um, knowledge about how to, let's say, build nuclear weapons um, in co control um, so that bad actors wouldn't have access to that knowledge and those skills. But I don't think that really works with AI. It has been proposed that AI should be done similarly, or with AI it should be done similarly, but I don't think it maybe should. I think we should let the pirate chief have, <laughs> have that access to the knowledge, but also by, at the same time, informing them that, okay, it's not very good to, you know, do piracy. Maybe, maybe there's other ways they could then find a way to make a living uh, with a more ethical um, um, work, hopefully. I'll, I'll expect to hear from the pirate chief what their feedback is on this question when I, when I get to meet them. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask one last question there? Okay, my, my very last question would be, um, um, when you talk about agency uh, and, and uh, you explained a lot uh, about how you were working with kids, uh, uh, I was just wondering, um, is there also uh, some aspects of personality of these kids that are important at that moment? Um, and have, the same question is also, is there also cultural differences that we have to keep in mind? Because your MOOC is in several languages. Uh, I assume in, in Europe, well, there is some differences in how people look at something like agency. Uh, and do you already experience that? or? How, how do you think about this? Well, I think this is a, 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 a nice question in the sense that I will have to invite everyone present and everyone um, who hears this to help us in exploring that. Like, we have collaborations in Finnish schools, and the Finnish society, of course, is, is special in, in many ways and different from other societies. So we only have experience um, in, our, in our classrooms. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to do some sort of comparative studies in other cultures, other countries, um, to understand what, what really are the cultural aspects of, of that and do comparisons. With the elements of AI, of course, we do have access to, like I pointed, I think 170 countries at least, and I think there's probably more. Um, so we're actually doing, as we speak, some studies on people's um, attitudes toward AI and, and particularly asking where they're from. So we'll, we're, we'll learn a bit more about that in the near future. But with the kids, we don't have like the, the opportunity to do that. And for that, I think we need to come together. Uh, but what would maybe be a better place to do that um, than, than this workshop and this community? 
I was about to say, uh, you can also come to the Bologna conference uh, <laughs> yes. in, in, in June, uh, where AI yeah. is again one of the, the, well, the main team actually of the conference. Uh, so looking yeah. forward to hear more about that uh, in Thank the future. You. Thank you very much, Timo, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, And uh, we have a token of appreciation from our university and from Eden, and also the cell, uh, the the e-learning 25 years uh, celebration token. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.